I figured it out. The reason I got so much hate on my Worst Books of 2020 video last year was because I was drinking Bucks Fizz. That is not a classy drink. So to avoid getting any backlash this year, I've decided I'll get classy and I'll pour myself some red wine. So, I mean, this is the third video I've filmed <laughs> in a row. So I'm progressively getting more and more drunk. Let's, so yeah, let's see how we get on. Let's see how we get on. So disclaimer for this video. And I mean, I still did a disclaimer last year and it still fucking didn't do anything. <laughs> disclaimer is that this is all my opinion and I am not hating on anyone. I am not hating on the authors who wrote these books. I am not trying to be horrible. You know, these lists happen every single year and like everything, like there are your favorites, least favorites. You know, I've read a lot of books this year and some of them just weren't that great. And those are the books I'm gonna talk about today in this video. I need to be drunk for it apparently. But also if you find your favorite book in this list, again, like this is just my opinion and sometimes I don't have the best taste. Like, and that's fine. I'm not hating on you either. If one of your favorite books is in this list. I'm so sorry and I'm sure they are good for you and that's absolutely fine. So I will get into the video then. And some of these books I've already unhauled. Some of them I've unhauled but kept the physical copy of so that I could talk about it in this video. And I feel like if you know me at all, you'll know exactly what book that will be. So yeah, let's stop beating around the bush. Let's talk about my worst and disappointing books of 2021. So yes, I'm not just doing my worst. I'm doing what I did last year. I'm also putting my disappointing books in this video. I want to section this one into two parts though. I want to talk about my disappointing books first. So they're not exactly bad books. They're not exactly my worst books of the year. They're just books that really disappointed me. I either had high expectations for or I was expecting something else. And I didn't have enough disappointing books to make its own kind of video. And I didn't actually even have enough worst books to make its own video, to be honest. Like I genuinely do end up enjoying a lot of books that I end up reading. But yeah, that's essentially going to be the rundown of this video. I'm going to start with the disappointing books and then go to my worst books of 2021. So let's start with my disappointing books and... God, I don't want to actually. <laughs> I don't actually want to, to be honest. <laughs> the first book I'm going to talk about, and I'm so sorry to so many people, is The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. This is a case of genuinely was expecting something totally different. And that might be my fault. It's not the book's fault, but also saying that though, I did find this book rather dull at times and after reading because I loved my best friend's exorcism that was my first Grady Hendrix book and then I moved to horror store which I really enjoyed not as much as my best friend's exorcism but I still enjoyed it and then I did the southern book club's guide to saying vampires and it was okay it was all right it wasn't fabulous or anything and then this is my fourth one and I've been reading Grady Hendrix for two years now okay and I still have a couple more that I need to read and I was considering Grady Hendrix as one of my favorite kind of horror adult writers but every book I've read has just gotten like kind of progressively less exciting and, and worse but I will say that this isn't a bad book or anything that's not one of my worst books of the year I'm just so disappointed in it Final Girls support group it's support well it it does <laughs> it does follow some uh, Final Girls and they have survived massacres they survived real life atrocities and they now are supporting each other with an anonymous group that they meet every now and then and everything's supposed to be secure and everything and we follow Lynette the, the main character is called Lynette isn't she yes Lynette and she is very protective of herself and she is very paranoid about somebody finding her so she tries to do every single precaution that she can in order to protect herself but you know things happen and eventually one of the final girls from this support group ends up getting killed Lynette needs to try and find out why and what's happening and who's killing them I love that idea but then this just turned into such a, a weird book because that, that's kind of a bit of like a slasher kind of horror kind of summary and then this book was just totally different it was just it was a little bit of like aimless wandering for a lot of it it was not scary in the slightest which I maybe it wasn't supposed to be the horror element of it I don't think was there I liked Lynette fair enough as character I thought she was very well developed and very well done she is terrified and you can feel that and it's very well written in that regard but I just couldn't care for like the majority of the other characters. And I like the whole idea of the whole final girl support group, I do. I just felt like the execution was lacking. God, I had so many more thoughts of this when I first read it. I was expecting really a slasher, like a kind of slasher book and I didn't really get that. And then wasn't a big fan of the ending. The way it wrapped up, the way it ended up unfolding, 
I didn't really care all that much. I was a little bit surprised by one of the twists. Actually, no, two of the twists. Yeah. So yeah, I was actually quite surprised by the who done it. But I think this is one where my expectations were too high. And maybe if I gave it a reread, I would enjoy it more. But for now, it's a disappointing book to me. And I'm kind of falling out of love with Grady Hendrix, unfortunately. Another disappointing book was Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin. And this one is a gothic classic. I was supposed to read this at university and I didn't. And you know what? My past self was correct. I did not want to waste my time with this. And I'm not saying this is a total waste of time. I mean, I love gothic literature, classic gothic literature. I want to put that out there. I know I read middle grade and whatnot, but gothic literature was something that I was so passionate about at university that I love finding other gothic classics. And this one has been on my TBR for a long time. And I was so excited to read it because apparently it followed Melmoth the Wanderer who had sold his soul to the devil and he was doomed to like wander the earth for eternity and try to get, you know, a victim to swap places with him and things like that. That sounds interesting interesting, right? The book was just not really about that at all. What this book was, it was kind of almost like a short stories even of different people who aren't Melmoth the Wanderer go through different people who are in different stages of their life or whatever and you know they go through some turmoil, some trials and whatnot and Honestly, I could not tell you a single character name or what actually happened to these characters because it was so dull. And then they would be visited by Melmoth. And then that was pretty much it. And then we go to somebody else. And it was essentially just a tale of people having met Melmoth the Wanderer over the years. And maybe, maybe if I give this more time and attention, maybe I would enjoy it more. Which is why, again, it's on my disappointing books because I was expecting a really gothic, really exciting kind of classic. And I just didn't get that. It just was far too dull. But I think if maybe... Now I've got that expectation out that I would enjoy more on a reread. So I'm not unholding this or anything. In fact, I think I do want to give this another try and maybe try and slow it down, maybe annotate and find out more of the story beats of this book because I just think I was missing something entirely. But yeah, I wouldn't go off that summary I gave you. False advertising, if you ask me. Yeah, sold his soul in exchange for immortality in a satanic bargain. Now praise on the helpless in the darkest moments, offering to ease their suffering if they will take his place and release him from his centuries of tortured wanderings. Torch tortured? Did I just say tortured? You don't really get that. It's essentially just a lot of waffle essentially. Also, let me know, are you a red wine drinker, white wine drinker, neither? Let me know. I drink all wine. If it's wine, it's, it goes in. Okay, next up, I mean, I feel like I've just ruined it because I was holding up the entire time of saying that, is The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. And I didn't like The Starless Sea, but I was still holding out hope that I would enjoy The Night Circus because with The Starless Sea, I felt like a lot of my issues people told me weren't present in The Night Circus. And I was like, okay, I'm willing to give this one a try. And also I have heard great things about this. It's a few of my friends' favorite books and, and whatnot. But I was just bored <laughs> again. I'm trying so hard to read more lyrical books, more adult books, but I just felt like this had, well, a great idea for a plot. And it just kind of went, and that was a really pitiful, I mean, very well written. I will give it that. And so was The Starless Sea. I would give that that. I didn't care about characters. I didn't care about anything that was going on after a certain point. I, it started out pretty strong, in my opinion. I thought it was, you know, pretty good um, to begin with. And then it just fell apart. As soon as Erin Morgenstern tried to put a plot together, it was just like, nah. I'm out. So I really wanted to love this one. I did. I thought I want to redeem myself after the Starless Sea. It didn't happen. Another disappointing one that I've already unhauled is The Revenant by Michael Punk. And I was bored by this one as well. I had seen the movie before. Can't remember a great deal about the movie other than the bear attack that happens in it. And Leo DiCaprio is great in that movie as well. But beside that, the book was just dull. I did try. I tried with all of them. Is it worth talking about? Probably not. Probably not, but uh, I feel like I have to hit a certain time talking about each book. Otherwise, you might think, why is it on the list if you can't even talk about it? Why is it disappointing and not one of the worst? Well, disappointing because I, I expected better. Well written, as a lot of the books I ended up not liking are. And again, it's all subjective. It's all very subjective. So it doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't. You probably know the plot of The Revenant. Well, they're kind of going through the woods 
and they get attacked by a bear. Yeah, this whole group, and only one of them gets attacked by a bear, and the rest of the group leave this person behind, and they expect him to be dead, like, they expect him to die, and he will just, you know, drag them back, and they'll waste resources and things trying to get back home, so they just leave him there. But it turns out this guy survives. He manages to find his way back home. It was just so unsatisfying, like, it was an unsatisfying revenge story, and I want revenge to feel sweet, you know? I want it to really pay off but it didn't in this one. It didn't, it didn't do it for me. It didn't hit that spot. It didn't hit the G spot. Next I have I'm Thinking of Ended Things by Ian Reid. I was so excited to read this one. I've seen some buzz for this. Still haven't seen the movie either. I read this for a reading vlog, which I, I love the reading vlog I read this for actually. I thought it was a good reading vlog, if I do say so myself. Like it started off really well. And then the car ride in this, Um, oh, should I tell you what it's about? Okay, so we, unfo we follow a, woman who isn't named and her and her boyfriend are driving to the boyfriend's parents house. They get to the parents house, it's a little bit weird. They end up coming back from the parents house but they take like a bit of a detour and come to a school and shit hits the van. And I loved the idea of it, I loved some of it. I will say I loved some of it. It did grip me in some parts. I liked the whole narration style, how some of it was. I think at the end of each chapter, it was two people talking to one another about this horrific incident that happened that involved a lot of blood. And that was really intriguing. I was like, okay, what happened? I wanna know what happened. But, but the majority of this book, this is a short book, right? I think like the first half of this book is the goddamn car ride to this parent's house. And it got so boring. I remember there was a part where she's looking at her boyfriend and she is watching him. Oh no, actually this is when they're at the house, I think. Is this when they're eating dinner? I can't remember. But either way, it might be in the car, can't remember. Either way, like she fixates on him chewing. And we get a paragraph on his chewing. And this is the kind of book where it just used the words when it didn't need to use the words. Saying that though, I'm not an expert. I'm not an editor of this book. I didn't write this book. Ian Reid probably had a clear cut direction for what he wanted this book to be. But for me, I just don't want to hear about someone chewing. And the car ride just lasted far too long. I was feeling tense to begin with. My tension just deflated the longer it went on and it just couldn't hold my interest or it couldn't hold the tension and the suspense that I was really hoping to get from this book. Like it's so disappointing because I genuinely did want to love this book. I really did. And it didn't do it for me. Sorry, I'm not even showing the cover. But I still give it three stars. It's just disappointing, not one of the worst. And you know what? Some of it I didn't really quite understand. So maybe, see, this is, I'm so generous. Like I'll kind of want to give it a reread at some point, see if I can understand it better. There is like a really good twist. I like the twist. But there are some things I just don't understand. So maybe upon a reread, I might appreciate it more. Honestly, I'm so generous. I'm definitely the kind of person to give second chances. Okay, one that I have unhold, and it wasn't bad again by any means, was Camp by Elsie Rosen. I really loved Jack of Hearts and Other Parts by the same author. And I had big hopes for Camp. I thought it was going to be really good. And then I read it and I was left feeling like a big part of why I love Jack of Hearts was missing. Like it, there was a big gap between Camp and Jack of Hearts that I think they're just like two totally different books, even though they're kind of the same, they're LGBTQ plus contemporary. We had a main character who I didn't really like. And it's a bit like, you know, at the very end of Greece when Sandy like changes herself completely and she has, I mean, she looks amazing, don't get me wrong. And she sings a killer song, but it's kind of like that whole idea of changing yourself for somebody else and becoming somebody totally different, that the past year was kind of unrecognizable. It was like catfishing, quite honestly. Like the main character was catfishing a guy they liked at this camp. And I really don't like catfishing, I really don't. I've had some bad experiences with catfishing in the past. I couldn't get on board with what the main character was doing. And I mean, there is like a moral to be learned, there is a lesson to be learned, but I just think it was so unrealistic the way it unfolded and the way things happened that it just, I lost all enjoyment of the book. And it didn't really have the, the humour of Jack of Hearts and I just felt like it wasn't really a book for me. And I don't want to read more from this author. Like honestly, I love Jack of Hearts so much. I thought it was so good. But Camp, it just, it failed to hit the spot for me, unfortunately. And I'm so disappointed about that. Like this is probably the most disappointing. This one and the Final Girl Support Group are genuine 100% disappointments. I wanted to love them so bad and it just didn't happen. Sucks to be me. So the last kind of like four books on the disappointing list are 
The Fiesta Books by R.L. Stein. So I read this book when I watched the Netflix movies for the first time. I really enjoyed the Netflix movies. They were good, campy fun. Then I read the four books. Or like these are the first four books in Fiesta, like the first four that were ever published. And they're in this like little collection, which I enjoy. And I can tell you which one was my least favorite. We have The New Girl, The Surprise Party, The Overnight, and Missing. Oh crap, now I can't remember which one was my least favorite. It might be in The Surprise Party. I try and be very lenient with young adult books and books where a teenager is the main character. But the teens are written so awfully in this. Like the first four books, they were so infuriating. I know these are a little bit dated. I know these came out like late 80s, I think. Times have changed. Like you can definitely feel how dated it is. Oh my gosh, I remember in, I think it was The Slumber Party, the main character, she has a friend who has been away for a year because I think like a murder happened or like a friend died and they were in a relationship with the person who died and that person left the town to grieve and they are like so heartbroken and stuff. So then when they come back, the main character decides to throw her a surprise party. Bear in mind that the main character knows this person hates surprise parties. So she's coming back from grieving. I think it might be in her boyfriend who died. It might be in her best friend. I can't remember. She thinks that's the best solution was to do something that she does not want to do. And she's getting death threats as well. And if she, you know, does this slumber party, she'll she'll die essentially. Like she's getting death threats. If Friends are getting death threats and she's still like, but I still want to throw the surprise party. I still want to have this party. I'm sorry, but you want to throw a surprise party for somebody who doesn't like surprise parties and you're getting death threats and you're still going to go through with it. Like what the fuck? I definitely talk more in depth about my thoughts on the first four books in this collection in my Fear Street reading vlog. So do check that out. I definitely go very in depth on all four. There were some, you know, plot holes in the new girl. Some of them were just like good ideas that just were poor executions. Not great, but I would like to read more Fear Street books and try to find ones that I love. Like that's probably gonna be my goal in 2022. Maybe read all of the Fear Street books, apart from the first four, because I've already read them quite recently. Then again, I'm doing a terrible job explaining why I didn't like this as much. But uh, yeah, this is disappointing. Not my worst, but definitely disappointing. This was before I did my Goosebumps reread, by the way. So uh, R.L. Stein was one of my favorite childhood authors and still is, like I can't change who my childhood favorite authors were. I can't rewrite history. So I was expecting a lot more from the Fiesta Street books, or at least the first four. And I just didn't like any of them. I think I gave one of them three stars, the rest of them two maybe, two of them three stars, the rest of them two. They weren't great. They weren't great to me. I would be interested to try and find a Fiesta Street book that I actually like. So. Mission on in 2022, not right now. Right, let's get into the worst books of 2021, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't really put middle grade or children's books in my worst books of anything. I do, however, have two classics that came out hundreds of years ago, or at least like one of them was 100 years ago, the other one's like 200 years ago, I don't know. And then there is another like middle grade children's book that I think is no surprise to absolutely anybody that it's in this list. It came out in the 90s, okay? Anyway, let's get into it. So the two children's classics that are in this video are Peter Pan by J.M. Barry and The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. <sighs> I have struggled so much with children's classics. They've tested my fucking patience. I know they were written in a totally different time. I know things were different back then. I know, but I can't force myself to like it just because it was written 100 years ago. So I still bloody hate them. So Peter Pan, genuinely infuriated by, I don't know what it is about children's classics that have really despicable main characters. Like I hated Peter Pan. He would kill lost boys. He would be so neglectful and rude and awful and arrogant, horrible child. It just took away all of the magic of Peter Pan. Like I was obsessed with the idea of Neverland as a kid and the, you know, whole flying and meeting mermaids and pirates and all of that. Like it's so brilliant. But then this book, Peter Pan, ruins that. It shatters the magic by having such an awful, awful person kind of spearheading it. And I know it's fine to have unlikable main characters sometimes, but Peter Pan is like a whole other level, a whole other level of despicable. I believe I rant about this in a video where I talk about the Silver Age of Disney animation where I compare this with the movie. And this is also like not appropriate for kids. We have so much swearing in this. We also have an orgy a fairy orgy that happens on page 61 in this edition, by the way. Uh, you don't actually see it happen, but it just, it's mentioned in passing, like, 
a couple of drunk fairies were, you know, coming from an orgy or something like that. And I was like, really? Chapter 10 of this is so uncomfortable. Honestly, it's the worst, probably chapter of anything I've ever read before. This is the chapter that regards mostly the indigenous people of Neverland and the horrible racist stereotypes of those people. And we have Peter being a colonizer and like, why, why, why? There are so many passages that make me so uncomfortable that I could not even speak them out loud. But yeah, chapter 10 was awful hated it. It's horrible. It's just awful. It's nasty. I don't like it at all. Secret Garden. One thing I appreciated about this book, one thing, is how nature can be restorative. And I loved the focus of nature for some of this book. That was fine. That was good. I liked that. Everything else I didn't like. I hated the racism and the ableism in this book. Trying to read this book outside of studying it, I, it's so hard to do, which is why I would never recommend this to a child. Like, I would never recommend a child to read this book. You know, we have a main character who physically abuses the black people of this story, which is irredeemable. It is irredeemable. She never apologizes. She never learns her lesson. She goes through the book and yay, yay, she becomes a better person by the end. Yay, I don't give a fuck. She does not make up for the fact that she is an abusive, racist little cow, and I hate her. Like, I hate Peter Pan, I hate... I don't even remember her name. I don't remember her name. Mary? Is it Mary? Yeah, Mary Lennox. Hate her. One of the worst characters in a book ever, quite honestly. I also didn't like the disability representation in this as well. Like, in the way it kind of got resolved, I'm like, really? This is a book that I really wanted to love. It's a classic, and it's one that, you know, a secret garden, it sounds so whimsical and so beautiful, and fair enough, the garden was beautifully described. The rest of it, pants. Absolutely pants. I throw my hands up at these authors. I really do. So the only, like, kind of more recent middle grade, I guess, children's book, came out in the 90s and is in this list I mentioned before is Say Cheese and Die Again by R.L. Stein. Again, I'm never ever going to mention like any kind of recent middle grades or I guess any middle grade that came out in like the last 10 to 20 years, I would never mention on this kind of video. But this one, it genuinely was terrible, absolutely terrible. And I do have a whole reading vlog reading all 62 original Goosebumps books in one month, which is really fun. And there were a lot of bad Goosebumps, a lot of bad ones, like 80%. Okay, maybe 75% like of Goosebumps books were god awful. And bear in mind though, I loved them as a child. I have the whole nostalgia factor to it. I loved them so much. Just reading them as an adult, just not the same, which is fair enough. Again, like, I totally get it. Like I'm an adult, I'm not the age category anymore. It's whatever it is. But I still think you have to give children credit or the target audience credit as well, because this was just so dumb. Like this followed on the storyline from the first stage season die. So we have the same characters. We have a camera that when you take a photo of someone, something bad happens. And we had a character who didn't learn their lesson from the first book. They are so selfish. They are so bad. And not just that, but there is just so much fat phobia in this book too. It's so infuriating, quite honestly. And I never really want to talk about this book again. I've talked about it so many times now. And I hated this one. I hated it. Like, there were so many silly decisions made. None of it made sense. If this had to follow different characters who didn't understand the rules of the world or the rules of the camera, fair enough. But the fact that this main character willingly puts people in danger just to prove a point, just to show the teacher that their essay on the whole, you know, doomed camera, the whole scary camera, whatever, was real. It's such a pathetic excuse to get people in hospital. And it's still, even by the end of the book, after everything that happens, he still doesn't learn his lesson. He still does what he shouldn't do and what he's learned this entire book not to do. And he still does it. He still does it. There was something else I wanted to say, but I went on a bit of a run there. Oh, yeah, now I remember. I looked at my notes. I have so many notes from the Goosebumps series. The whole premise of the camera reversing its effects once you rip up a photo from the first one, they totally forget about that in this book. Like, the whole reason the first book resolved was because they ripped up the photo and everything went back to normal. That is how it was resolved. Why didn't they just do that to begin with? Greg knew that. And when bad things started to happen to people, why didn't he just rip up the photo and move on with his life? And also, like, going back to the fat phobia, when Greg, I can't remember how he got the photo of himself taken, but he becomes fat. And that is where all the fat shaming and fat phobia comes from. And there is just so many horrible, awful things said in this book. But like, he knew that if you ripped the photo, you would go back to the way you were before. Why didn't you do that? Which is why this would have been so much more beneficial if it had to just follow different characters who didn't know 
what they knew. But even then, again, these characters didn't learn. These characters didn't learn from the first book, hated them, hated this book, worst Goosebumps book I've ever read. So now that's the children's classics and the middle grade out of the way, onto the adult in YA then, because I had Sex and the City by Candace Bushnell. I was so excited for this book. Like, and I knew, I knew it wouldn't be like the TV show. I knew that this was kind of more like a column format. This was column kind of thing going on. It was more like non-fiction, fictionalized kind of thing. Hated it. It felt dated, it felt irrelevant. And I know this is supposed to be following like real people in New York at this time. There was no nuance to it, I felt. It was men versus women. And that was it, essentially. Like, the entire book, there was no nuance to the arguments that were being had. There was, like, homophobia in it. And, again, like, that's fine if you're, like, displaying a real-life window into the past. In this time, anyway, it's contemporary. So, like, a real-life window into that moment in time. Homophobia happens. I, I know it too well. But this made me feel bad for being gay. <laughs> There's nothing redeemable about it. And I know that's probably the point. I know that's probably the point. But I just felt judged by this book. I felt I was too old, too ugly, too gay. And I wouldn't mind as much, but it's never really rectified. And I guess, like, same with Stephen Gordon, I could not find any redeemable qualities about it because nothing was apologised for, the racism wasn't apologised for, nothing was amended. And it's like the same in here. All of this stuff, all this cruel stuff happens, all the fat shaming and people being called ugly and unattractive and so much judgmental stuff happening in this book that none of it's really, like, that's bad, like, that's wrong. And I know not everything has to have a moral, but when it's a book like Sex in the City, there was just nothing redeemable about it. There are like some characters in this, like we still have like a Samantha, a Carrie and all of that. They're still in here. And there are like the fictionalized parts of it. Even then, there is just no strong friendships. There's no likable characters, nothing. Essentially, it made me feel worse about myself. <laughs> I do have a reading blog on this as well, where I kind of parody Sex in the City at the start of it. I thought it was pretty funny. So if you want to check out more of my thoughts, please do so in that video. I hate saying that. I hate directing people to other videos. Oh, if you want to see what I think, go to this video. But I read this in February, so I've kind of forgotten a lot of stuff. Yeah, if you want more in depth, that's the video to go to. Another dated one. I don't know if maybe in the future I should like not put dated books in here, because it came out in the 70s. And that is I Know I Did Last Summer by Lois Duncan. This uh, is a case where the movie is just so much better than the book, in my opinion, in my opinion. I do actually do a deep dive analysis into the book and the movie and what's different, what's similar in a video. So if you wanna check that out, I'll link it down below. I thought it was interesting. But essentially, same kind of premise, just different kind of outcome and different culprit and there isn't a fisherman in the book, which I didn't mind. I didn't mind there not being a fisherman, but I did want some kind of thrill to it. I don't really know if it's like classed as a teen thriller, but it's definitely teen mystery. And I was a little bit intrigued by it. I did want to know more about the person they ran over. I wanted to know more about who was, you know, giving them threatening notes and all of that. But one thing I hated about this book, and again, no spoilers, is that they don't really figure anything out for themselves. They end up getting told what happened. Like the main characters, like, you know how you had the whole Eureka? I was gonna say Yuzuka. You know when characters in these mystery books have this like Eureka moment where they figured it all out and they've got the culprit and they know exactly what happened. Everything's just told to the main characters. They didn't work shit out themselves. They had no fucking clue. And because of that, because there was not really any kind of intricate, detailed trail figuring out who the person behind it all is, they just got told it in a very anticlimactic, well, two kind of anticlimactic scenes because the person behind it tells the best friend character and then she jumps through a window and escapes. And then Julie is confronted by this person and it's revealed to them too. Oh God, it had such a silly ending, quite honestly. And just none of it was figured out, none of it worked. And I'm like, I would have loved a mystery where the main characters worked it out for themselves. But it just felt obvious from the beginning, quite honestly. I will say I didn't expect a certain twist, but it wasn't surprising enough to save this book, if you ask me. So. Unfortunately, not a great book in my eyes. I don't think it's aged very well. And it's a case of the movie being better than the book, unfortunately. Okay, next is one that I've already unhauled as well, and that's The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. I have watched the movie, so I wasn't surprised at all by what was happening. And I didn't go into this book thinking, oh, I can't wait to find out who the killer is. Like, I knew who it was to begin with. And I didn't mind. I still wanted to read it. It was on my TBR for years. Like, I wasn't reading it to be shocked. I wanted to be thrilled. I wanted 
kind of like really interesting characters and kind of like intrigue in that as well. Like I know the intrigue is non existent when you know what happens, but I still wanted exciting stuff to happen and interesting stuff to happen. I didn't like any of the characters and I think that is why I mainly didn't connect with this book. I still think it was a pretty decent story, but I just hated all the characters quite honestly. I didn't find anything redeemable about them. I ended up finding it very, very dull. I don't know if it would have been different had I not seen the film first. I'll never know that. So you could say this is a little bit unfair to put on this list, but I still didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it, didn't like the characters. It was boring to me. And that's what I can really say about it. Like it's so unmemorable that I kind of just don't really remember a whole lot. And I don't even remember the movie all that much too. I just remember Emily Blunt being amazing. Oh, and I also remember Gaston being in it. Mm. Yeah. And I remember who died. I remember how they died. I remember the climax. Oh, actually, you know what? I remember a lot more than I thought of the movie, not of the book. But then again, a lot of the book was pretty much the same. So I guess I do remember the book quite a lot too. Hmm. So when I say unmemorable, I mean that in a metaphorical sense. Oh, next. Oh God, right, the next one. Right, the next one is my worst book of 2021. I still have two more to talk after this one, but this is my worst book of 2021. Guess I'd better pick it up. Ah. Den of Vipers by K.A. Knight. Do I even need to talk about this book anymore? We have Frostheart, which is like my favourite middle grade book series of all time. And everyone associates me with Frostheart because I can't shut up about it. Is Den of Vipers going to be my next Frostheart? Where I just don't shut up about it, but for different reasons. Ah, oh, right. Let me top up because this might take a while. You know, it's this is painful. Like, this is so painful trying to get everything out of me right now. And you know what? I remember quite a lot about this book. So one thing I will give it is that it's memorable. It is memorable. So I'll give it that. Oh, do I have to hold it up as a question? Oh, God. <laughs> I opened up the book and the first thing I saw was my pussy clenches. I'm willing to try anything two, maybe three times. So I did not mind the fact that this book is quite an extreme book, and a very extreme romance book. I think it's called Reverse Harem, I think it's called. But this follows Roxy. I will never forget her name or her birthday, because fun fact, we're both born on the same day. Quite honestly, that's the main reason I hate this book. Roxy is sold by her father to a gang called the Vipers, who literally act like teenage boys. So according to the back of the book, it talks about Roxy being sold to Ryder, Garrick, Kenzo and Diesel. And then she is going on to say like, they own me now. They can own my body, but they will never have my heart. The Vipers, I'm going to make them regret the day they took me. This girl, she bites too. I have a whole reading vlog on this and why this is such a awful book. Like I can say that with my full chest. Like it's an awful book. You can like it, of course. Like, th this could be someone's favourite book. I don't mind that, of course. But this is just awful. Because with Roxy, she says she's going to fight back, whatever. I believe around about page 80, she starts masturbating over them. And then she quickly falls in love with them. If this had been better written, if we had more of a natural progression of this kind of love story between Roxy and the four vipers, I would have maybe enjoyed it more. But the writing in this is atrocious and I haven't said this about a single book on this list okay like I do not want to shit on authors and their writing style they probably have their own kind of methods of writing and I mean actually saying that I did kind of mention about Ian Reid using too many words in I'm thinking of ending things but I, just, I still said it was a well-written book okay this is just awful from page one absolutely awful and as outrageous as the sex scenes are and like I got a little bit giggly over it when I was reading it and obviously I, I was laughing a lot like I don't mind the sex scenes I didn't mind the extreme nature of the sex scenes but even they were poorly written and repetitive the same kind of adjectives the same way that her pussy clenched or the way he came in 20 seconds oh my god i literally just flicked through to a random page and found my pussy clenches her pussy clenched more times than i've actually slept around and i've slept around okay i'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that so like honestly no like kind of slut shaming from me i don't care about like the nature of the sex scenes or whatever like i don't care i don't judge but if these had just been written so much better, if this had been a natural progression, I wouldn't have found it. But Roxy is a character, she just unraveled. Her agency just went out the window. She didn't fight back whatsoever. She didn't even try. The ridiculousness of the love and romance in this, I just could not get on board with. I mean, I couldn't get on board with it to begin with because they fucking kidnapped her. But if K.A. Knight wanted me to believe 
that Roxy was going to fall in love with them. And I'm not going to spoil it, but the ending is so stupid. Make me believe it. Make me believe it. I did not believe it. Oh my God, I've just, because I thought maybe I'm missing some like important like review information about Den of Vipers. I have a 20 minute wrap up of Den of Vipers in my Den of Vipers vlog. I'm gonna watch it. I just wanted Roxy to be the person she was destined to be from the very beginning. She was always independent and strong. And then as soon as they come along and maybe you feel like, oh, she didn't have a choice and whatnot. And I'm again, I'm not spoiling anything that happens. She has a choice. She ends up having a choice. It just becomes the most ridiculous farce. And that's the best way I can describe this book is that it's a ridiculous farce. It, it just, like the men, the Kenzo and the Diesel and the whatever the rest of them are called, not even redeemable. They're not redeemable. They're not redeemable. They're not attractive. They're not people I would want to root for the main character to get with. They are supposed to be big, strong men. No, no. In every sense of the word, no. So if Roxy's pussy wasn't clenching, the Viper's cocks twitched. Honestly, repetitive, like my review of this right now. Horrible characters. I can't talk about this book anymore. I, you know, I think I've exhausted myself from this book. And now I, I'm just gonna remove myself from this narrative and just never talk about it again. But do check out my vlog for it, where I have that 20 minute rant. Although the whole video was like nearly 50 minutes long. Whew. I've unhauled the next kind of series and that's the Demon Otter Saga by Darren Shan. Read them all in a weekend. And while some of them were good, the main crux of the series was that it kind of devolved very quickly. And I think I got to about book five when I was like, was somewhat enjoying it then from that point on it just became again repetitive it became a bit ridiculous I felt like Darren Shan wrote himself into a corner and didn't really know how to wrap it up and I hated the ending so much the ending of this 10 book series hated it it tried to be exciting at some points but then there would be so many more moments that were so dull and dry like I thought it had such a great start to the series I think book one book two two and book four were like really great actually i think they were like high three stars and then i think the rest of them were just like three stars or less so this would have made my disappointing books however because of that ending at the end of book 10 and how the series wrapped up made it one of the worst books one of the worst series i've ever read i again have a reading vlog on this entire series but this is a series that had so much promise but the more the more you ended up knowing about this world or the demon Nata world and what was going on, the more you knew, the more you kind of saw the plot holes. Again, I'm not trying to shit on Darren Chan, but it just felt like he was writing each book right there and then on the spot. By the time it was wrapped up, it was just the most ridiculous, silliest thing that could have possibly ever happened. That made the entire series redundant, made it all redundant. I hate endings of either books or you know, series or TV shows, movies, where the whole thing was just redundant. Like, why waste my time? Why? Who do you think you are wasting my time? I read this entire 10 book series and you're gonna do that to me. Disgusting! And then finally, the last book in this is Hothead by Demon Swede. This is a DNF that I'm definitely including. I don't feel fair giving DNFs this kind of spot. However, this one I read enough of and I then read some sketchy things about the author anyway. However, like one of the main reasons why I hate this book so much and why I couldn't continue it, this almost felt like queer baiting. So we have this much anticipated romance between these firefighters, right? Oh, like even just saying it. Saying it out loud makes me moist. And that's what we're waiting for, isn't it? We're waiting for these two guys, the two main characters, these hot, beautiful firemen. I mean, look at that cover. Look, oh, just fucking look at it. You're waiting for that moment when they first kiss. They first have sex, right? And it's gonna be so hot and heavy. And we have this kind of subplot where one of them is doing porn uh, to make money and they get the love interest to do the porn with them. And then finally, they are gonna get into a position where they're gonna kiss and they're gonna fuck. Fade to black. Fade to fucking black. What the fuck? We're getting their very first kiss in sex. Right, I know it's like in front of cameras and it's like porn or whatever. So it to them, it probably doesn't matter because 
you know, like heart and love and romance and stuff isn't there when they're doing porn. But it's the first time they're kissing each other. It's the first time they're seeing each other naked. It's the first time they're going to be looking down there and seeing their, you know. Why would you skip that? Why would you fade to black? I was infuriated. I was livid when that happened. And I threw the book across the room, went on the internet to see if other people thought this was god awful and to see if it was still worth reading. And then I found out all the shitty stuff about the author by Googling him. And then I was like, no, I'm not continuing. But you can't redo the first time. You can't redo it. So I don't care if they do have sex again. It's not gonna be the first time because they did it before and it faded to black. We didn't even get to see it. That was just the biggest tease I've ever seen in my life. So it's not really queer beating because queer beating means something totally different. But you know, it's that kind of same feeling you get when somebody's queer baited you. You know what I mean? It's that same betrayal. It's be it's betrayal. That's it. That's that's the word I was looking for. It's betrayal. This book betrayed me. Just like Den of Vipers betrayed me from that. You know what? All of these books betrayed me. All of them. So they deserve to be on this list, if you ask me. But honestly, I just... I was really hoping that I would love Hothead. I really wanted something steamy and amazing and romantic and I wanted to fall in love. Like I'm still waiting for that perfect romance to give five stars to. I mean, I did give Get Like Chloe Brown five stars, but I'm on about like something like really steamy and sexy and like hard hitting romance. And you know, like LGBTQ plus romance. That's what I want. I haven't found it yet. I'm still on a mission. I'm still searching. I'm still looking. I'm holding out. You know, I'm holding out for a five star romance as Bonnie Tyler used to say. It is Bonnie Tyler, right? Let me just double check. Oh, thank God it is. So that was my worst anticipating books of 2021. Please don't attack me on Twitter, please. This is the only negative list I do in the year, okay? It's good to get it off my chest. And I have my reasons. Everyone can love or hate a book the way they want to. It's all so subjective, so. Yeah. So that's my video. I hope you enjoyed. Please leave a like if you did. Subscribe if you haven't already. And let me know in the comments what your worst book of 2021 was. Or if you have multiple, let me know. Let's stir some shit up. And hopefully I will see you in the next video. Bye. Also cheers. Cheers to another year. Oh, thank God. Did I say bye? Bye.